Most basic statistical tools are designed to answer a single question in a snapshot in time. This works for most situations, but it leaves a lot of interesting questions on the table. As much as we don't want them to, things evolve and change over time. This is the problem of longitudinal data. But it's not just the problems that change. The statistical tools change and improve as well. Statisticians have thought a lot about the problem of time and have developed some interesting tools to address it. There's too many to cover in just one video, so this video will actually be the first of a three-part series on longitudinal data analysis. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. Let's get started. I keep saying problem of longitudinal data, so what exactly is the problem? To understand this, you need to understand one of the core assumptions that enable many statistical models to work the independent and identically distributed assumption, or IID assumption. As an example, let's look at a data set consisting of six people picked at random. From each person, we'll measure how much time each of them have spent on their phone in a single day, their phone screen time. The IID assumption consists of two parts. Independent means that one person's screen time can't influence or be influenced by any other person. If person one happens to spend more time on their phone when we observe their data, this shouldn't lead person five to increase or decrease their screen time. Identically distributed means that the underlying probability distribution that governs the randomness of screen time is the same for each person. For example, we might use a normal distribution with a large positive mean and some variance to model randomness in the screen time. Under the identical distribution assumption, everyone's screen time would be seen as a sample from this distribution, and we could write this idea succinctly as follows, where yi represents the screen time of person i. The iid assumption is significant because it allows important probability theorems to be used and for certain calculations to be simplified. For instance, many standard hypothesis tests rely on the central limit theorem to gain access to a convenient sampling distribution, and by extension, the central limit theorem relies on the IID assumption. Generalized linear models rely on maximum likelihood theory to estimate their parameters. And I think you know by now what maximum likelihood needs to assume. The point is, the IID assumption is a core assumption in the most commonly used models. One way to visualize the IID assumption is to stack the data into a vector. Using the Y notation from earlier, we'll get a column vector with six elements, where each element represents one observation from each person. By convention, since these data are already observed, we write them as lowercase y. But remember that we also assume that all of these observations each come from a normal distribution. So we can think of the observed data as a realization of these normal variants. You might be used to doing operations on each of the observations one by one, but it's also completely valid to talk about the data set in its entirety. If we wanted to take the mean of this vector, this is the same as taking the expectation of each of the elements in the vector and putting them in their own column vector. Since all of the data come from the same normal distribution, we just get a vector with all the same mean values mu. When we take the variance of single observations, we get back single values. But things are a little different when we take the variances of vectors of random variables. Instead of a vector of variances, we get a square matrix. Since there are six observations, the dimensions of this matrix are six by six. The elements of this matrix represent different ideas. The variances for each person are on the diagonal. In general, each person might have their own variance, indicated by these person-specific subscripts. But since the data are IID, everyone has the same variance, so we don't need the subscripts. Usually, the off-diagonal values represent how much the data between two people will vary with each other, or covary. For this reason, the entire matrix is given a special name, the covariance matrix. Despite its name, it contains both variances and covariances. Covariances are calculated as the product of the standard deviations for each person and the correlation between them. The specific location of the off-diagonal indicates a specific covariance between two people. So this element represents the covariance between the first and third person. This is what a covariance matrix looks like in general, but it's greatly simplified by the IID assumption. In statistical terms, this means that the covariance between any two people is zero which means that the covariance matrix under IID data is just a simple diagonal matrix. If your covariance matrix looks like this, then it's a hint that you have IID data. With this matrix visual in mind, you're ready to understand the problem of longitudinal data better. Let's consider a new data set. Instead of having six people as our data, we're only going to include two people. For this experiment, we're going to look at their screen time at three time points. Once when we recruit them, another after three months, and a final measurement after six months. The total sample size remains the same, but the data now has a different character to it. For now, 
let's just talk about this first person. Since this data was observed at three time points, we can take all their data and stack into a vector of size three. Conventionally, we'd start them by order, so the baseline measurement comes first, followed by the three, then the six month observation. Now we need two indices, i and j, because both people and their observations need to be indexed separately. i indexes the person, while j indexes the measurement. So y12 would denote the second observation in the first person. We could also use y1 to refer to the vector for the data for the first person. Assuming nothing dramatic happens, their screen time should look relatively similar over time. That is, we expect there to be some degree of within-person correlation between these three measurements. If we were to look at the covariance matrix for this person's data, we'd expect these off-diagonal covariance elements to be non-zero. So, the problem of longitudinal data is that it violates the independent element of the IID assumption. That being said, we do assume some form of independence with longitudinal data. If we were to consider the overall covariance matrix of both people, we'll see that it takes on a particular form. The covariances within a person are non-zero, but we usually assume that the observations between people are still independent, meaning these particular covariances are still zero. This gives the covariance matrix of the entire data set a so-called square diagonal. Now that you know more about longitudinal data and how to express it in notation, we can finally discuss a way to account for its particular characteristics. Per very normal style, we'll motivate our model with an underlying research problem. Let's say that we're interested in studying graduate students and quantifying how their average phone usage changes through the course of a single school year. We'll measure their screen time at the start of the school year, after fall semester, and at the end of the academic year. Since we're interested in the average behavior over time, a naive approach we could use is linear regression, using the different time points as categorical regressors. With linear regression, these coefficients are interpreted as average shifts from the average baseline time. If we estimate these coefficients, we can use them to answer our research question and characterize how the average screen time changes over time. But there's a problem with this approach. If we use the typical ordinary least squares estimators for these coefficients, we need to assume that the distinct errors in the data are uncorrelated. When you're practicing statistics, it's important to distinguish between how you characterize the data and the statistical model you're using to approximate it. Longitudinal data naturally has correlation due to repeated measurements from each person, but using ordinary least squares estimators would ignore this. A better model would correct for these correlations. So is there such a model? Well, yeah, otherwise I wouldn't be making this video. Instead of using the ordinary least squares model, we could turn to its close cousin, the generalized least squares model, or GLS model. Like its name suggests, the generalized least squares model is a generalization of ordinary least squares, and it was developed by Alexander Eitken in 1935. It has many useful applications, and one of them is to model longitudinal data. It states that the expected value of a vector of outcomes across time is given by this linear combination of parameters, and that the covariance matrix of this vector is given by some matrix sigma. Equivalently, we could also talk about the covariance matrix in terms of a correlation matrix, since correlation is just normalized covariance. Similar to the OLS estimators, we can talk about the GLS model in terms of the errors. The expected value of the error vector would be zero, and their covariance matrix would be the same sigma. Based on this notation, you can see that ordinary least squares is just a special case of generalized least squares, where the correlation matrix is just the identity matrix. That being said, how do we actually estimate the regression parameters under GLS? This expression represents the famous ordinary least squares estimators for the regression coefficients, but this expression represents the estimators for the GLS model. You can see the covariance of the outcome slash errors incorporated into the estimators here and here. One way to interpret the GLS estimators is that it corrects the OLS estimators with this adjustment by the covariance matrix. While GLS gives us a way to correct for the correlation in the data, it brings us a new problem too. We need to know what this correlation matrix actually looks like. But as with many things in statistics, it's usually unknown to us. So we need to estimate them from the data. But this brings up yet another problem. Depending on how many observations each person has, this matrix and the number of parameters we need to estimate can grow really large. In our specific case, we have three observations per person. So there are three unknown correlations. But for a more general case, if we make k observations per person, then we need to estimate k times k minus one over two correlation parameters. And this is just per person too. 
Without any assumptions on the correlation matrix, we'll quickly lose all of our degrees of freedom and lose substantial power with the model. So we often assume that every person in the data has the same correlation matrix. Furthermore, we also make assumptions on the correlation structure as well. Instead of having each correlation be unique, a so-called unstructured correlation, we may further assume that the correlations follow a particular pattern. For example, we may assume an autoregressive structure, where the correlation between any two time points is just a power of a single correlation. For time points that are one step apart, they have a correlation of just rho, while time points that are two steps apart are rho squared, and so on and so forth. This structure simplifies the number of correlation parameters to just one, but still allows the correlation to change over time. If we're able to pick a correlation structure that better models the data, then we'll get more precise results. We have methods for choosing a correlation structure for our analyses, but I won't go over it here. Now that you know the GLS model, let's use it in a simulated analysis so you can actually see the benefits of having it in your toolkit. I'm going to bring in three libraries, the Tidyverse for data wrangling, MASS for data generation, and NLME for its implementation of the GLS model. To generate the data, I'm going to repeat the following process for 10 distinct people. I'm going to generate data from a multivariate normal distribution to create three correlated observations for each person. I'll specify the mean vector for this distribution to be 600, 660, and 540 to indicate average screen time at the three time points in our example. I'm going to create a covariance matrix that has an autoregressive structure to it. The precise values don't matter here, other than the fact that I'm going to make it such that the observations have a relatively high correlation of 0.7. If I run this code by itself, I'll get a sample from this three variant normal. After running this loop, I'll have a data set of 30 observations with 10 people in it. If I plot our data, we can see how the screen time of each person evolves over time. You can roughly see that the averages at each time point match up with the true mean vector I specified earlier. We can take this longitudinal data set and analyze it two different ways, one using the OLS estimators and another with the GLS estimators. Here's a comparison of the estimated regression coefficients for both models. You can see that both models essentially get the same results, so relatively close to the true values I generated from. But here's a look at the standard errors and p-values associated with each of these coefficients. Even though they estimate the same regression coefficients, ignoring the inherent correlation in the data leads to OLS estimators to have much higher standard deviations. And this has downstream effects on the statistical significance of these coefficients. The OLS estimates manage to detect a significant change at time point 2 at a 5% significance level, but not at time point 3. Compare this to the GLS estimators, which have virtually zero p-value. Keep in mind that I simulated the data such that there are changes over time, so the OLS estimators would lead us to commit a type 2 error. Due to the randomness in data, this won't always happen, but I use this example to highlight what happens when your model doesn't account for the characteristics in the data. Longitudinal data represents a concrete example of how common statistical assumptions can be broken in the real world. And it's our job as responsible statisticians to make sure that our models approximate the real world as best as they can. To wrap up this video, I'll leave you with one last problem. The GLS estimators give us a way to deal with continuous outcomes in a longitudinal context. What if we want to estimate binary or count outcomes over time? How would we do that? This will be the topic of the second video of this series. If you enjoyed this video, I hope I can convince you to like it and subscribe to the channel. My goal is to get to 100,000 subscribers by the time I graduate in a few weeks. To stay up to date with uploads, you can also subscribe to the channel newsletter. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. But if you're still listening to this, here's one last thing. I'm sorry it's been a while since I last uploaded. I've been taking some time to rest because I was preparing for my dissertation, and I'm happy to announce that I'm officially a PhD in biostatistics. Seven years ago, I didn't even believe that I was the type of person that could get a PhD, but I'm glad that, like so many times before, I was wrong. Thanks to everyone for your kind words on my post a few weeks ago, and thank you for joining me on this journey. Okay, goodbye for real.